friends and family. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the November edition of Pieces Collective. We are talking about the Wisdom, Wellness, and Wealth event. My goodness, I am so excited. There are so many things that are happening. We have uh, Thanksgiving coming up. We've got Christmas coming up. We have holiday season is in the air. Can you smell it? I can smell it. And today, not only will you be able to smell it, but you'll be able to taste it. Mmm, delicious. Because we have chefs in the house, chefs from all over the place, chefs making delicious things. And the thing is, we're going to take you through uh, the appetizers, some uh, side dishes, a main course, all the way into dessert, talking to wonderful chefs, how they do what they do, where their inspiration comes from, and their specific take on food. I want to know what your specific take on food is. Do you like it? I, I like it. <laughs> what are you cooking this afternoon or what are you cooking this holiday se season that is inspiring to you? I want to say once more, you are here joining me at Let's Get Cooking, Ideas and Inspiration for the Holiday for Holiday Entertaining. And just to remind you, this is the Wisdom, Wellness and Wealth event brought to you by the Pieces Collective. The Pieces Collective has created space where artists and makers who have the hunger to create can do so and make a living, even those who want to create food, right? Today we get to share some time with some amazing chefs who are creating in their own special way and learn a little bit about their stories, their backgrounds, and the inspiration for their dishes and businesses. Maybe you can be inspired to create something yourself or jump in to deciding to create and make food for a living. Oh, maybe you thought about it. And today, is your is your sign you can use this as your sign but before we bring out our chefs i'd like to introduce the executive chef at cafe pieces collective ikrama muhammad who founded the pieces collective in 2018 the goal of which is to contribute to human development through experiential learning economics and education please join me in welcoming chef ikrama muhammad yeah, to i like Mr. that i like that shannon and i can smell it. I can smell what's going on backstage. I'm looking forward to it. But That's before great. we get to that, we're going to get to that in a minute. But before on behalf of the Pieces Collective, I would like to thank you for coming this evening and being part of our community. Um, we are a small 501c3 organization with a big vision. Our vision is to see a world where all people embrace creativity, service, and truth. Our mission at the Peace Collective is to use our creativity as makers to support and promote the traditional handcraft arts and to make self-sustaining communities. We sell beautifully handcrafted uh, goods, clothing, scarves, uh, self-care products, jewelry, and uh, we use the proceeds from those sales to help raise awareness, to, de to develop programs that help raise awareness and to inspire people to action. So community is key to our survival today more than ever. Historically, community has been our protection. Any hopes that we have come from the community, our spirit or lack of it is sustained by the community. And craft and art are the flavor of community. Traditionally, uh, handcrafting arts like sewing, quilting, knitting, they bring communities together. I know you've all heard of sewing circles, knitting circles, quilting circles. And not only do they bring people together, but they meet the needs of, communi of certain communities. The first benefit of um, these circles is practical. We make things for the community. We make clothing, we make uh, home decor, curtains, the basics, food, clothing, and shelter. The second benefit is social. During the gathering of these circles, people bond over stories and cultural traditions that are passed down from generation to generation, and it produces a connectedness that we much need today. Last but not least, many times these activities turned into movements for social change. In fact, Rosa Parks herself 
was a seamstress. Uh, today, they have a name for this. It's called craft a visit And it's a term coined by a design company that represents a worldwide movement at the intersection of craft and activism. This is where artists and crafters armed with traditional materials like yarn, uh, glue sticks, quilt patterns, sewing needles, exacto knives, use their hands to protest social and political inequalities and injustices. So one of the past examples of that is with where the, that kind of intersection came into play is with G's Ben's quilters. Many of you probably have heard of them. This small secluded community in Alabama uh, contained a group of women who quilted for necessity. And out of that necessity came this beautiful art. Uh, then they became involved in the civil rights movement after Dr. Martin Luther King visited them and encouraged them to register to vote. So they took the ferry, which was the only access uh, directly to the, the mainland. Uh, otherwise, they would have to drive 40 miles on a narrow rural road, making it very difficult. So they took the ferry and they went across the river and uh, attempted to register to vote. And after the white supremacist authorities at that time noticed the rise in blacks trying to vote, they cut off ferry service. So, you know, these, these tricks and these things continue. Of course, cutting off the ferry service made life very, very difficult for the people of G's Bend. And that ferry service was not put back into service until 2006, which was 40 years later that uh, they made people suffer just because they wanted to vote. But a little while after that, they weren't deterred. The quilters in that area united, they organized and they formed the Freedom Quilting Bee. And this was a business community that included G's Ben and they promoted their work nationally and helped their local economy by their actions. So this serves as an example for the pieces collective today, uh, not just to protest inequalities and injustices, but to unite makers and communities and to help build an economy through the sale of our products that will help remove barriers and give us access to opportunities that will help our communities uh, thrive. We need this because we can lay an economic and educational foundation for future generations. And that's a must and the duty of every generation. I know we've all heard of the um, Charles Dickens Tale of Two Cities quote, which says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. But I don't know if we know the rest of that uh, quote. And it says, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. And I think that kind of describes the times that we're in now. So we must learn to do for self or suffer the consequences. And that's no problem because we've always been innovators and creators and we must return to that way of life. So we invite you to visit our website, The Pieces, P-E-A-C-E-S collective.org, and to subscribe to our weekly newsletter where you'll get lots of great information about makers, about community, about arts. And please support us by shopping, donating, and sharing with your family and friends. We believe happiness is handmade and we invite you to join us. You know what else brings community together? Food, right? Sunday dinners, cookouts, um, holidays, just about anything that uh, we celebrate includes food. So tonight we're blessed to have talented chefs and foodies here with us to share uh, all things delicious. We thank them and we thank you and we hope you benefit from tonight's program and that you're inspired to action. Peace and love. Thank you, Akrama. Thank you. 
All right, friends and family and chefs and cooks, we are here to look at and savor delicious food uh, and experience what these chefs have to offer. This discussion is led by chefs. So to get us started, I'd like to welcome Zaria Stott Turner. Using real fruits, grains, and herbs, Zaria Stott lets the ingredients speak for themselves. Business uh, her business, Decadent Truth, thinks about your health and mind. Zaria wants clients to understand what it is they're really eating while enjoying real tasty ingredients. Zaria is a full-time home baker, a chef, wife, daughter, and sister. Welcome, Zaria Stott. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Shannon, my big sister. <laughs> Welcome to my kitchen. My name is Zaria Stott Turner. Wait, um, wait, yeah. just wait. You're about to jump into some amazing things, but we also have some other amazing chefs that are going to join us uh, okay. just to <laughs> just to say hi for oh, a little okay. bit. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ooh, it's happening, it's happening. <laughs> Excellent. This is Zaria. We also have Nuri Mohammed, chef or chef stretched. Uh, established in 2019, Nuri Mohammed owns and operates Chef Stretch Kitchen and provides catering services and phenomenal dine in experiences for brunches and special occasions in the comfort of clients' homes offices, and special destinations. Chef Stretch serves as an executive sous chef at The Grove in Upper Marlboro, Marlboro, Maryland, where he is responsible for creating and preparing delicious specialty menus and meals. Welcome, Chef Stretch. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Excited. I'm at work right now. I'm supposed to be at home, but it's all good. Um, I'm excited to be here and to show you guys some sexy food. <laughs> Excellent. All right. We also are joined by Brittany Titus. Brittany and her fiance, LeVar Mitchell, created Cooking with Locks and Love, inspired by going through their lock journey, love journey, and exploration of love for flavors and food. They bring those three experiences together in a tangible way to share with kindred spirits, lovers of food, and wholesome dishes. Welcome, Brittany. Hi, it's good to have you. Yes, just so you know, you're muted and we want to be able to hear everything you have to say about your delicious food. Sorry. Hey, guys. <laughs> it's good to see you. All right, we're not done yet. We also have Chef Tourette, uh, Chef, Chef Thomas, Chef Tourette. Kepra Thomas. Chef Thomas is owner of Kepra's Kitchen, LLC, an elite chef service for individuals and organizations who require personalized creation of great food. A woman of achievement, Chef Thomas can claim the youngest and first woman of color to lead a culinary college in the state of Maryland. Chef Thomas is the resident chef and leadership advisor for Black Girls Global Exchange, BGGE, a youth-led, revolutionary, peer learning, and cross-cultural movement. Welcome, Chef Tourette. Chef Thomas, I should say. Good to see you. Hi there. Hey there. <laughs> We also have Yasim Butler. Yasim's love of food created their pandemic project of making cooking content under the banner of Good Cub 3D Kitchen. Hashtag good food at a hashtag good price to promote a hashtag good life. I like saying the hashtags. His current culinary goal is to make the perfect vegan ice cream at home. Yum. I want perfect vegan ice cream. Welcome, Jeff Butler. Thank you. Thank you. It's so glad. I'm so glad to be here. And I've almost cracked it. Drop that close. Yeah, almost cracked it. Almost there. Well, when you like, please send me a pint, you know, because I, I would love that. Uh, I want everyone just to say, hey, we have so many people in the chat. Alita and Janice, Christina, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's so great to have you. Uh, before we just jump in to all the things that we are going to see today, I want to start off this conversation in the chat. If you could, if you could tell us something that you really tried to make and 
failed at it, just failed. And I would like to ask the same of our of our panelists, something that you tried to make just so, because people are watching, they're like, oh my gosh, real chefs, but they need to know that you've had some mistakes as well. What are some things, what are some stories that you've made <laughs> that you just failed? Uh, Yassine, we'll start with you. Okay, so vegan ice cream, right? When I tell you the second time I attempted to make vegan ice cream, altering this recipe, I ended up with basically cookie dough. That's how thick it was. I don't know where I went left. I don't know if I overcooked my um, my custard or if I had too much cornstarch. But when I tell you it was basically cookie dough, that's exact. I, I think I could have baked it, honestly, to be 100% oh, honest. Terrible. It was delicious, but awful. Absolutely <laughs> awful. <laughs> <laughs> Zaria, what you look like you have a story for us. Yeah, actually, um, I vegan cookies, actually, uh, or, or rather not vegan cookies, but gluten free um, cookies, um, cause I, especially because I tried to use my own flours like oat flour and passion flour. And uh, many a times I've tried to use just oat flour, for instance, and I'll basically come to the oven with just like a pool of butter and oats swimming in the pan because it doesn't want to stick or whatever. So it's definitely a science. And um, I've obviously I'm introducing vegan or gluten free cookies to you today. So I've gotten it down. But when I experiment more with other flavors of gluten free cookies, it can be very tricky. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I see Hadi in the chat um, said his first brisket. I got it down to 100% now, though. Well done, Hadi. Lovely. <laughs> I'm glad that uh, you finally got it down. It takes it takes practice. Uh, I don't I don't know, Zaria. Soupy, soupy oats doesn't sound great, but we're excited to see. <laughs> We're excited to see what you come up, what you've come up with. Um, let's see. Yes, uh, locks, locks, and love. Do you have, Brittany? Do you have a story for us? Um, you want to know something? Actually, <laughs> the craziest thing that I've messed up on, you wouldn't believe, is rice. No. The simplicity of rice, I have destroyed it numerous amount of times. We are My from South Carolina, so it's like he's like, How do you not know how to make rice? I'm like, I'm from New York, we go to the, the bodega of the street, you know, like we don't just be out here having rice like this. So, rice was definitely like a horrific thing, but now I almost make it better. Yeah, I'm so good. Come on, come on. The simplest <laughs> things can be the, the hardest. I see pretty much everything. Christina says, uh, I make a wreck. Even veggies get burned. Oh, no, Christina, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what about this peanut butter inside stuffing? What are you talking? No, what are you? Who is stuffing their, pe their turkeys with peanut butter? I'm not sure. Uh, Chef Stretch, what about you? <laughs> um... I be honest. I mean, oh, they said I can adhere to the probably the rice thing. I know I made rice. It took me a while to learn everything. one to one ratio. But. The easiest thing to do is is to roast your veggies. Say, uh, this is it's a it's a lot going on, Chef Stretch. There's a there's a lot. I think happening. that was her talking. Yeah, <laughs> there's a couple of things going on, but we all have like. We've passed and we've failed. It happens, but this is great. This is good to know that chefs at all of your all's levels still are experimenting, are really experimenting and trying to get it right and making sure that it's right. Uh, Chef Tourette, uh, let's see. Can you give us uh, something that you have have had? Uh, what do they call it? The growing opportunities, growth opportunities, or just completely failed at anything? I know it. I know it. We're going to come, we're going to weave in and out. But before we get, before we get too weavy, uh, I know that people are actually here to see food. So we actually, right now, we're going to start with Nori and the York mac and cheese Stretch. called the cauliflower version of mac and cheese. And since we're starting with something a little bit different, uh, Chef Stretch, get us through this uh, mac, uh, mac and cheese. Okay, so 
A little bit of a detour. Uh, the mac and cheese was to be made at home right now. I am now called into work to have to run the kitchen. So I'm going to be making something different, uh, something that's very easy that everybody can make at home. Um, I'm going to be making some tacos with a mango, uh, like mango salsa um, and a salsa verde. And then, yeah, just garnish it with some beautiful micro greens. I'll make one comment to the last thing. Anybody that is viewing this or watching, uh, being a chef, no chef in the world is perfect. Every chef will make mistakes in life, but it's about learning from those mistakes and just, yeah, keep pushing, never giving up. That's what makes you a better chef. There's always more stuff to learn in being a chef. There's not one chef that can say, oh, they know everything, because they don't, even some of the best chefs in the world. So, yeah, like, that's what Excellent. I would say. So um, my demonstration today is going to be these beautiful tacos right here. Got some show you these tacos so i put some pineapple and uh, mango salsa on top of them now i am just going to garnish them with some micro greens can you guys see this all right i know it's on the phone yeah we can see it so just a little bit of greens on the top make them look sexy you know micro greens <laughs> make everything look nice uh, the pineapple sauce is just an easy pineapple mangoes diced, uh, some red onions, jalapeno, cilantro, red peppers, you know, nice freshness in the taco. Salsa verde is made with tomatillos, uh, cooked with jalapenos, onions on the stove, and then blended and finished with cilantro. This is the sauce right here in this bottle. We're going to squirt this sauce on top to finish the tacos off. And yeah, that's it. Um, I wonder, so we're, we are talking a little bit about holiday, holiday menus, but the thing is that I remember, I think it was last year in my, for, for Christmas, we did brisket tacos. And oh. this is reminding me of that. I'm wondering when you are thinking outside the box, what is your go-to? Um, well, I mean, working in the kitchen i do work with a lot of uh you know hispanic and latino uh, ethnic community and that mm -hmm. is what they eat during the holidays they eat a lot of tacos or pupusas or things like that so um for me also it's just like expanding just making different things because I, I like get bored making soul food all day you know i, I get tired <laughs> of that so for me it's just expanding making different things different flavor profiles and even you know jumping into other you know communities and ethnic groups learning what they eat for the holidays so maybe mm -hmm. i can bring some of that to my table at home or just you know elevate like instead of a regular mac and cheese i might make like a lobster white truffle mac and cheese or something more fun to elevate it so that's just what i like to do and, and i love that idea of elevating taking what we're already doing and just adding something a little different to make it oh make just it different better. and exciting to make and to eat Exactly. Like we're deep, deep frying turkey. So I got all of these turkeys here. Uh, I got a deep fry for orders for a couple of next few days. So I'm in here having fun. That's what I do. <laughs> That's a so lot. Thank you guys for turkey. having me. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of them. It's a lot. Thank you, Chef Stretch. Thank you guys for having me. Of course. Of course. My goodness, so many things are coming up. Thank you, everybody in the chat. Make sure if you have questions for our chefs, uh, let, let us know because the chefs want to know uh, how to help you and how to, how to talk to you as far as answering your questions and what we're making. Uh, I'd love to know in the chat while you're at it, what are you making this holiday season? So we had we had Chef Stretch uh, with the tacos, and we're gonna go ahead and get into this. Brittany, Brittany, can you talk to us about your chicken breast with rice? Sure. Now, of course, you know when you got three kids, stuff completely goes left. So. And my three-year-old knocked off all the rice on the floor, so we had to kind of switch up a little bit here, you know? So it's okay. We go with the roll, the punches around here. So we decided um, this holiday, before all the real food starts coming out, you know, and they tell you, all right, food going to be ready, but it's really not ready till like 6, 7, almost 8 o'clock at night. So we was like to kind of go ahead and hold you over a little bit. We're just going to do a super quick, simple chicken stir fry. So we just quickly went ahead and we just got some chicken breasts. I'm going to add it in this bowl. Okay. Also just went ahead and we just got some simple, some simple broccoli. Get that nice and cheap at Walmart, food line, something like that. Then we also went ahead and got some mushrooms. 
again, super healthy. I'm about to get married, so I got I to look right, you know, so I can't do nothing fried right now. Like, should stretch over there with some good tacos, but we're going to keep it simple. So we're just going to go ahead and mix all that up. Now, one little secret ingredient that we actually use, we created our own seasoning line, and this one is called specifically Kickin' Chicken. So you guys can see it's on our website, Cook With Lots of Love. So you don't need any other seasoning literally except for this, nothing else. So it has all the type of flavors that you would need. We didn't pour too, too much on there, but this is pretty much how it should look. So once we go ahead, we're going to give that a good little mix. And again, kind of to keep it simple, just so you guys can kind of hear what it sounds like. Nice and simple. So you'll go ahead and just kind of stir that up a few times around here. You want to make sure you get your chicken nice and cooked. I don't know if you guys can kind of see that. Trust me, this pan is like crazy hot. So that's the only reason why I'm kind of cooking it off the stove. But you'll go ahead and you'll let that cook down for a few more moments. Usually I will let something simple like this sit for maybe about 10 to 15 minutes. That's how simple it is to cook. And my kids love it. We love it. It's something quick. It's something healthy, not too hearty right before, you know, dinner actually starts. So yeah, once you go ahead and you plate this up, something quick and hearty, especially for people who are also trying to lose weight too, like me. So yeah, hopefully you guys can try something simple for the holidays. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brittany. <laughs> Before we move to the next couple of uh, the, the next chefs, I want to just talk a little bit about things that you've learned. If you were to give a tip to everyone here, like the most, if someone is just starting off right now and they're just like, what, what do I need to know? What do I need to know? What would be the tip that you would uh, give them? I see Yassim already having a tip in mind. Um, Yassim, what have you got? Here's the thing. What I have learned about cooking and people who can't cook, people who can't cook generally just don't have patience. Tips and when I'm saying that, Jeff Thomas with Capera's Kitchen. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> You've got it. Go ahead. Um, so people who you can't cook generally just don't have patience. Either you don't have enough patience to fully read and understand the Can recipe you before you take it, or you don't have the patience to sit and stand and be there with the food as it's cooking. So take your time when you're cooking. It may not come just like that, but if you take your time, you read through everything, you follow the directions as they are, you're gonna get a good product. It may not be the best, but it will be a good product for your first start. And as you grow in your patience, you'll grow in your understanding of food. Nice, patience, patience. I love that, I love that. Zaria, yeah. Yeah, I have, two, I have two tips. Um, sort of similar to when people say, if you can walk, you can dance. Um, I say, if you can, if you can read, you can cook. Um, it's, I think that it's really about just, even if it takes you a long time, if you're slower and just getting all the ingredients right, all the measurements. Um, and then also you have to not be afraid to make mistakes. Um, so even being on both sides, as far as being trained and being a trainer as a line cook, um, I definitely had people be really frustrated with me, but then I've been able to, um, I've had chefs be frustrated with me, but I've been able to, um, train others and see them get frustrated, but tell them, okay, it's all right, let's do it again. Or if it burns, you start over and it's, it's okay. It's like, it's not the end of the world and you just have to keep trying. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Keep, keep trying, keep trying. Brittany, any tips? Um, sorry, I would have to say the biggest thing for me that I'm learning in this process is a lot of people in here, they're seasoned chefs. And, you know, sometimes it can be a little intimidating coming into this field because people have so much experience, so many beautiful dishes and things like that. Um, but one thing I can really say for everybody who's either looking to try something new, whether it's in the food business or not, really don't stop. Like, we didn't think, like, okay, people are really going to see us, our catering business, our seasoning line. But when you really start pushing it and people really start tasting what you put into your, your food, your heart and your soul, people eventually, they're going to rock with you and they're going to buy it, you know? So don't stop. Like, literally, we just had somebody, I mean, we are kind of new in this catering. We just had somebody say, you know what, from now on, you guys are going to be our caterers and 
she's actually related to somebody who works at BET. So something small can turn into something super large. So don't stop. Like, don't stop. Just keep going, you know? I love that. I love that. Chef Stratch, you have any tips for us starting out? Yeah, um, I would just piggyback off of what she said. Um, just never give up. It's going to always be, you know, bumps in the road. Starting out, if you want to start a business or just start cooking, it's just perseverance, you know, keep pushing through. Um, you know, you can do anything you put your mind to. Um, like, I probably not supposed to say it, but like me starting as a chef, I never thought I would have the experience to cook with Gordon Ramsay. Like, and I cook with Gordon Ramsay. So, like, it's just never give up, never stop, always keep pushing, keep bettering yourself. And yeah, just that's all I can say. Never give up because you can do anything you put your mind to. With with that, with uh, never get up, give up. You can do anything you put your mind to. Before we move on to um, our next chefs, I would love to show the video, uh, just just highlighting all of our chefs. Excellent, <laughs> excellent job. Um, and one more thing before we move on, I really, after watching that video, it dawns on me that we we really get to see, obviously, on on chefs' websites, uh, the the best of the best, right? You create the best thing, you take a picture, and I'm wondering for you all, what is the best thing that you enjoy cooking? What and why? What is this something that you really enjoy cooking? And why? I'm wondering, um, Brittany, do you have something in mind? Um, I think I really like, like, when I mean to tell you I'm a server, I'm a server. Like, I'm old school. I'll even serve my fiance just, you know, just by him sitting down. I love, if that means that everybody wants six different things, I don't mind making six different things for people. I just love feeding people, seeing their expression, when they love something, when they like it, even if they don't like it, it kind of just like, okay, well, maybe I need to tweak something different. So it's really people's reactions to the different types of food that we create. It really kind of, not gonna lie, I can hype you up a little bit when you know your food is good. So it, it's a good feeling, you know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Zaria, anything that you really like to cook? Um, um, I guess the first thing that pops in my mind is lasagna. <laughs> um, it's, I, I, well, I like to eat it a lot. <laughs> um, but I, I, it, it really, lasagna really does take time, especially if you're doing it from scratch, if you're chopping everything and shredding all your cheeses and making your own tomato sauce and everything it takes, it takes time. So it's just, you know, I guess it's the process that's, really awesome. And then the outcome of just biting through all those layers that you made and mixed together and put together is just like, okay, cool. I, I love this. It's my favorite thing. Do I make it all the time? No, because I, I do like to make it from scratch. So it does take a very long time. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yasim, anything that you really enjoy uh, cooking? One of my favorite things to make is, um, I also love making a good uh, spinach white sauce lasagna, but mm. uh, the thing that I like really, really love making is ice cream. Just, mm. I love making ice cream. Literally, I spent almost every week for like seven months just making an episode of me making a different kind of ice cream. And it was glorious. It was just fun. Just so many different kinds, so many different ways. I love ice cream. I could eat it every day. 
But me and lactose <laughs> don't agree. Me and lactose don't agree anymore. So that's why we're moving on to vegan options so that I yes. don't, you know, die. But ice cream, it, I can make ice cream all the time. I can just is, make it. is there is there a reason you like making ice cream so much? Um, so growing up, there was a place on Staten Island. It, uh, it's called Ralph's. It is the like iconic Staten Island place to get ice cream. And it's such an old school creamery type ice cream place. You'd have block uh, lines around the block. And when I say around the block, I mean probably about a little over a quarter to a half a mile on a really hot summer um, before, you know, everybody had air conditioning. And so I just remember ice cream is just so uh nostalgic for me and so being able to make my own and have all of my own flavors and do whatever i want with it is just something that i can't disconnect from my childhood and that delicious uh ice cream made in the store that's awesome that's uh, i love that nostalgia chef tourette i'm wondering about you is there something that you uh really love to make Well, um, I live, certainly make everything from scratch, but I love making uh, soups. I mean, the, the weather, uh, especially when it's a little cooler out, um, I think all, it's always nice to, to, you know, whip a soup together. But I especially love to, to braise. Um, so, you know, braising meats, uh, making some ragouts. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm in the kitchen all the time. I'm wondering, I see you, yes, you I'll, I'll, I will, I, you will speak you, next. Oh, um, I have a question for her. I have a question for her, if you don't mind. Um, well, I was going to have uh, Chef Tourette tell okay, us. sure. What is, uh, what is braising? <laughs> well, braising is when. I've always you, heard it, but I don't know what it is. Really. Okay, yeah. So um, I'm all, I'm all, um, it. It, in, in my head and in my mind. So talking about classical um, techniques, cooking methods and, and those things. But basically um, you are searing off, most of the times you're braising meats. So you're, you're, you're searing off um, your meats once you have seasoned it. And then you're continuing the cooking process um, in the oven. So, and you're gonna add some liquid. You're not exactly covering the meat totally but you having just a, a, a good amount, you know, about halfway or so, and then you are covering um, up, maybe you're putting it in a, um, a, a Dutch oven, like you can get those wonderful porcelain or clay um, uh, ovens, and put your, your meat in there, and then you pop it in the oven. It continues to cook, and um, it will make your meats tender. Most of the times you're using the cuts <coughs> of the meat that are not tender on them on their own right so they need something um in addition to me so um yeah during the braising you know it's like low and slow so mm. um certainly it's part of the slow food movement as well as just you know yeah God. thank you <laughs> i heard somebody go mmm <laughs> Also, uh, Chef Stretch, <laughs> anything that you enjoy making? Um, I don't, uh, I would say I enjoy making. I enjoy making anything, whatever I'm putting my love into at the time. That's what I enjoy making. I enjoy baking. Um, I enjoy cooking seafood, lamb chops. I enjoy cooking anything. I don't really <laughs> have one favorite thing I enjoy. I love to cook anything. Good. Good to know. Uh, Chef Tourette was talking about loving to do soups. And if you're ready, I would love for you to take us through your soup for the evening. Our soup for the evening? Sure. Well, oh, no, uh, tonight. Oh, okay. I was going to say, we have one too that I make. But My soup was such chef. <laughs> chef Tourette, your soup. Yeah. Okay. So I am actually doing a butternut squash soup um, today. So I have my mise en place. So mise en place means um, to have everything together. So that can include your ingredients as well as your pots and pans, your utensils. But um, here I have on the sizzler platter my uh, mirepoix. 
So your mirepoix is your onions, your celery, and your carrots. And so certainly when you are cooking, um, you asked a question earlier about um, some of the things that, that might help you out in the kitchen. And that would be to make sure that you have all of your, um, when you're following a recipe, all of your food already cut and measured, ready to go. Most of the times, especially with the holidays, people have the difficulty of um, um, trying to cut everything and cook at the same time. So that gets in the way. So I have some mirepoix here. Then I have the uh, butternut squash. I have some thyme and I have some chives that's gonna be part of my, um, my garnish for this soup. But basically, you're just um, putting some oil in the, in the pot. You need a sauce pot, um, depending on the amount of soup, two um, or more, you want a little larger. But I'm just going to put a, a little bit of this in, turning it up. We always want to season with some aromatics. So um, thyme is the aromatic that I'm using. And I'm just, you don't even have to worry about um, taking the leaves off of the stem. Just then, we're going to season kosher salt, right? And some black pepper. And I ice with garlic, fresh garlic. It has medicinal purposes to it. Um, keeps the coals away, but I love fresh garlic. You're going to give that a stir. And basically, you don't really want any caramelization. That means a browning of your mirepoix. You just want to sweat um, the vegetables out. Then you can add your butternut squash. And I know you will be sharing. Uh-oh, lost my ear pad. I know you're going to be sharing the, um, the recipe with everyone. Um, but, you know, basically, put it in the pot. Let it cook down a bit. And then I add a vegetable stock or uh, a chicken stock, or you can just add some water, honestly. Um, but flavor, more flavor will come with your stocks. And then um, once it cooks, maybe about a half an hour or so, we're going to puree it totally in our blender. And basically, with the magic of television, you just puree. Um, and then the finished product, you have your butternut squash soup. That's delicious. And then I can just cut up some garnish and put on top. Delicious, delicious. Soups are, are really nice. They freeze well. No. That's one thing. You can make them ahead, right? Put some in the freezer. So I don't care. I mean... This is called a parade soup. So you have different um, classifications of soups. So, um, but you know, this is one of the easiest soups that I think you can, you can make and, and you use what you like. You can use a spaghetti squash, acorn squash, you know, zucchini. Um, but this is, I, I love butter squash soup. It has a sweetness to it. Um, it's just delicious. Thank you so much, Chef Tourette. I, I, I love also butternut squash soup. We're in the space uh, in the fall season and it is, uh, it is great. It is just a good soup. I see Zaria nodding. I saw you Zaria nodding about um, garlic having medicinal purposes. I'm wondering for everyone on the screen, is there something that you like to cook with specifically because of its medicinal purposes? Maybe garlic, what are some other things that you are using? Either it's just a favorite ingredient of yours. Is this for anyone or specifically for, me? Oh, I mean. <laughs> oh, I'm a ginger person. I love some good ginger. Um, it does help open you up. It's really got a lot of, as a, as a root, um, it has a lot of uh, antioxidants and really great things for you. It's been used in medicine from all over the world. So ginger is one of those those things that I really love for its medicinal purposes. When I'm feeling sick, chop up some ginger, 
um, some lemon, a little bit of honey, boil that down, and you can just allow that to sit out on the counter and drink as it goes. And as it ferments, it actually helps to make it better for you as it ferments. So it's really delicious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Zaria, yeah. Yeah, no, in, a, in addition and you don't to really that, to, you don't have to peel it. You don't have to peel it. That, um, I mean, I just got over a cold. And so I did, I did exactly that. I boiled garlic, lemon, and some honey. Um, also, I mean, it, it sounds a little bit intimidating, but I also just took some raw garlic and put a little honey on it and just popped it like a pill. And it kind of hurts a little bit, but <laughs> you know, it, it kind of gets things out. Um, and I also, I love, 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 love um, also just um, using it for um, salmon dishes as well. Um, and it's also really great to just, um, if you just put a bunch of it in some some oil, it softens, you can spread it right on top of some toast or something, and it's absolutely delicious. Delicious, delicious. Uh, Chef Tourette, any other, any other um, medicinal spices or additions that you use in your cooking? I do. Um, turmeric is a, a really good spice um, to use. Um, it aids in um, fighting inflammation in the body. So, um, you know, I actually added a little bit of turmeric to this soup as well. Um, but, you know, you can put turmeric in your, um, um, you can make a golden milk. You know, that's the mm -hmm. hot thing right now to um, mm -hmm. have it with a little bit of black pepper and um, your favorite nut milk. So if you do almond or oats or, um, you know, whatever you like, but um, adding a little bit of, of turmeric. You don't want to use too much because it can um, make your foods taste metallic. It's uh, oh. um, uh, um, yeah. I use a lot of I mean, you know, uh, fenugreek um, is wonderful. A lot of the the the, um, the herbs and the spices that they use in Mediterranean cooking. Um, Indian cooking and cuisine, Asian, a lot of Asian cuisines, all of those things are, are pretty, um, pretty good to use, medicinal. Cloves, you know, that's a natural um, uh, um, uh, painkiller. Is it empty? Yeah. You could just chew them, right? They, people used to just chew them as a painkiller, didn't they? Yeah, you can. I mean, it is bitter. Um, so if you if you like that, but you can also just put it on a um, a cotton swab um, and and pack it in if you have a toothache. I mean that's what Novocaine is made out of. Mm. One of the things. Who knew? Brittany, you know, um, <laughs> and I are like, oh. So I have a number of clients. <laughs> yes, that's what she says. If you have a, you know, you have a toothache, um, yeah, you don't need to go out and get aura gel. You can use some clove oil. But mm. what I was saying that food is just, it's, it's healing. I have a lot of clients who are um, either diabetic or they have um, heart issues. And so if you adjust the way that you eat, you can heal yourself. Um, mm. my, I cooked for my grandmother um, almost, well, the last five years of her life. And, um, you know, the doctors was always amazed that she was not diabetic and she was 98 years old. So um, she only ate my cooking. On that, with that, with the idea that uh, food can be healing, I'd like to go over to you, Zaria, because I feel like that is basically what your entire business is about as far as food in its natural form can be healing from from God, right? You're, you transferred your business from one uh, name to the other, and you can tell us about that. Uh, but the idea being that food in its natural form can be healing and, and delicious. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my business name before was Food by Zaria, Giving Others Delight, which is an acronym for God. Um, and I just revamped, I just revamped my business name and just overall my, 
my business and um, and narrowed things down to just baking um, to decadent truth. And uh, just keeping, of course, truth in there because I just feel like, you know, as a believer, God obviously is all about truth and he gives us our food and our ingredients and our produce and our vegetables and our fruits. And I uh, definitely believe that we should take advantage of that, of those <laughs> foods more um, than, you know, this, you know, these man-made or so ingredients um, using fruits more than uh, processed sugars because fruits have, have natural sugars um, and things like that. So, and, and yes, using things like uh, blending our own oats for flour and blending our own nuts for flour, you know, things that we can really do on our own by taking a natural ingredient and giving, um, it's important for me to give my clients uh, uh, baked goods um, that are delicious, but better for them. Uh, vegan and gluten-free as well. I do vegan, gluten-free, but also regular baked goods. But there's so many um, vegan and gluten-free items out there uh, that are labeled vegan and gluten-free. Um, and so people are like, oh, great, this is healthy for me. You know, it says vegan, um, but we're not looking at our ingredients that says like, you know, dye number three and gallon gum, you know, blah, 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 things we like, literally don't know or can pronounce. So I'm just like, okay, how can I... Sometimes I look at certain items that will say vegan or gluten free and I'm like, okay, well, this is simple enough. I'm not sure why it has all the ingredients, but I want to try to recreate this to be better. Um, so yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. And so as you're as you are talking about it, because I'm wondering, I'm wondering about the sugars and all of this. Why don't you go ahead and show us about your cookies? Yay! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. So I'm just going to um, tilt down. Um, the first two that went, I feel like we're pretty quick. So um, I'll try to do this quickly as well. So I'm doing a vegan and gluten-free um, chocolate chip cookie. Um, and uh, I also have a mise en place. Or if you want to be really cool, you could say, I have a mise, you know. So <laughs> I used to work in a kitchen and a uh, chef would be like, Zaria, do you have your mise? I'd be like, yes, I have my mise. So I feel a cool. Anyway, all right, so pass that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what's really cool about this um, recipe is that it's super easy and it is a one full recipe. Um, and it's really awesome to do with kids as well. It only has seven ingredients and I'm gonna tell you exactly what they are. We've got um, some cashew flour that I blended myself, raw cashews, that's it, yeah. And we've got some gluten-free oat flour Raw, raw oats, that's it, blended myself. Um, we also have um, three tablespoons of brown sugar, just three tablespoons. And we also have some semi-sweet chocolate chips. And I use the uh, Enjoy Life brand um, because they're free of, you know, pretty much a lot of allergens that you can think of and they're vegan and they're gluten-free. Um, and then we've got some baking powder and we also have just a pinch of salt, you can't barely see it, but like that's maybe one fourth teaspoon, if that. And then we also have some unsweetened almond milk and the type of almond milk that I highly recommend is called Elmhurst. Um, the ingredients on it is literally water and almonds, that's it. Um, the Almond Joy stuff, stop drinking it, stop using it, it's not good for you, it's crap, okay? <laughs> So get Almhurst, um, it's great. Um, and that is definitely what I've been using. So uh, again, all right, so we're just gonna go ahead and get started. Of course, dry ingredients are gonna go in. So I'm gonna put in my cashew flour and my oat flour. Again, really easy to just blend these yourself. I have a Vita mix, so it blends, you know, rocks practically, it's, it's really good at blending. Um, my three tablespoons of brown sugar. So yeah, this is low in sugar. Uh, branded, it's this only makes about five cookies, um, but the cookies are actually quite heavy because of course you've got all of these cashews and all these oats in there basically. Um, so there's that. And then we have a two thirds cup of these simple sweet chocolate chips. Okay. And baking powder. Salt. Okay. 
And then we are going to use one of my favorite tools, <laughs> the rubber spatula. And you're just basically going to, of course, blend everything together. Make sure you break up all any clumps that you might see. You can use a whisk as well. I like to use my rubber spatula for this recipe in particular, just so I can really like sort of mash down all the clumps and everything like that. Any clumps. You can also use a wooden spoon, but um, for me in particular, I like this kind of spatula because it does really great with scraping sides. So just a few more mushing. Can you hear me, Zaria? I can. Oh, perfect. Great. Um, I'm wondering, so I, I bake, but not as well as you. And <laughs> one of the things that I, I like, I always do that I know I'm not supposed to do is I, I go, I don't care. Everything in the bowl at the same time, <laughs> wet ingredients, dry ingredients, <laughs> it's all going in the same place. So I noticed that you were very intentional about making sure all the dry ingredients go in first. Is there actually a reason that you know of that that works? I'm going to be completely honest. I've just seen and have been taught all my life dry ingredients. I will, I will say this. My husband actually made me some wheat pancakes um, the other day, and they were fantastic. And my husband doesn't cook, okay? So I was, like, shocked once again. Um, <laughs> but he was like, I just put everything in one bowl. But then I noticed that it said dry ingredients and then wet ingredients, and I freaked out. But um, he said he put everything in one bowl, and it worked. So um, for something that's a little bit more complicated, like uh, I don't think there are any dry ingredients to a souffle, or maybe there are you somewhat, another chef can correct me if um, I'm wrong, but for something like that, you definitely want to be a little bit more specific if there are, um, you know, dry and wet ingredients. Mm -hmm. So what tends to happen is um, as you're, unless you're going to be, whisking it all together what can happen when you're just folding in is you have uneven pockets of some ingredients that don't evenly disperse so small amount of ingredients like uh baking soda or salt when you get them all mixed together into your dry first especially if you're baking sifting it out that makes sure that everything all of those small ingredients that have those big impacts like leavening make sure it gets through every layer of your flour so that it's all evenly coated it's all evenly distributed if you're just pouring everything in together then you may have a pocket of flour clump here or a pocket of baking soda over here and so you get a little bubble over here and a little dry clump over there so that's what putting it all together really does for you is evenly distributes all of the magic that goes into uh making uh flour and eggs turn into something light and fluffy and delicious <laughs> Very cool. yeah you see no. you seem uh explained that you and i guess the, if, I, if i can interject just a little bit um also, the fact that, um, you know, cooking is a, is, is a science. There's some chemistry involved. And so um, the, the food is, has molecules. So they do something. Um, you know, they are bouncing around in the pot, um, you know, when you're boiling water or um, when your opposing ingredients are, are coming together. So, yeah, Yassim is, is right on the money with that. It makes a difference sometimes, yes. <laughs> much more yes. so. Sometimes. So in the baking, on the baking side of the house, rather than the savory, than the savory side. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Very true. Baking is science. The rest of cooking is just, you know, madness. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we've got your dry ingredients. Yes. So we have all of our dry ingredients in the bowl. Um, and then we're just putting in our three tablespoons of almond milk. Um, and I love this part. It's kind of like magic because a little bit, it's, you would think three tablespoons with all this dry ingredients, it's not going to get wet or anything, but it actually does. So I'm just going to go ahead and pour all of that in. And this is what it looks like now. And I'm going to show you what it looks like in just a few moments. While you're mixing, Zaria, will you talk a little bit about uh, your just trial and error when it comes to 
um, making t things like this. Uh, Yassim talked about patience. And I know, I just know, because you and I talk, that you know, you'll make a batch of something, you'll throw it out. You'll make another batch of something, you'll throw it out. Um, what are you looking yeah. for when you're, uh, as, a, as a chef, what are you looking for for an outcome? Um, well, I will say like with cookies in particular, um, I will say with cookies in particular, obviously like a certain kind of texture, um, you know, just for uh, a texture and of course, or a taste. Um, for example, um, another example um, of what sort of came as a fail was me trying to do my own peanut butter cookies by blending my own peanuts and using that. I did that. I did gluten-free flour and the texture was great, but it wasn't peanut buttery at all. <laughs> I was like, where is happening? So anyway, I tried adding even more sugar and I was like, okay, whatever. I'll just add more sugar and maybe it'll taste more peanut buttery, but it wasn't working. So that's still something I'm trying to master. And, um, as far as, you know, like I said, things that just sort of melt because I'm still trying gluten-free stuff. Um, it could be really frustrating um, because obviously, you know, I'm wasting ingredients and, and things like that. Um, but also what helps is sometimes I, 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 I do Google other, I sometimes I put, I, I grab other ideas from several recipes and I put, you know, things together. I'm like, ah, okay, you know, that worked. They're all just use a little bit of this instead of that so it's again it, it really is like a whole side more i feel like it's a little bit more of a science when it comes to baking than it is uh cooking um you know especially as somebody that cooks uh it, it definitely is more trial and error with baking for me yeah yeah give us these cookies awesome all right so <laughs> this is our dough look yeah. it's all stuck so this is what it looks like so before it was all sort of fluffy and more dry, but now it's all, you know, sort of sticky. Um, so usually what would happen is you have the dough and you would refrigerate it for 10 minutes, but of course we're on a certain amount of time. Um, so we're just gonna go ahead and we're gonna use a one fourth cup to scoop out our dough like this. Mm. So you said that you used your own uh, cashew flour. I, you know, if it were me, I would assume that if I put cashews in into a blender, it would come out as cashew butter. So how, 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 how? Um, so <laughs> what, you witchcraft, witchcraft. You have to basically, um, you have to, you have to watch your blender. Um, because obviously it's going to go through a flour phase first, mm -hmm. and then if it goes longer, it's going to turn into butter. So yeah, if you just turn on your blender, put your cashews in a blender and no. uh, turn it on and walk away for like five minutes, yeah, you're going to come back and it's going to probably be butter or at least with cashews, from my experience, it's going to be sort of this more of a hard chunky sort of butter. Um, but with cashews, what you want to do um, is you want to pulse a few times and then like turn up your blender all the way and then stop, mix it up, pulse and turn it up all the way and stop and then you've got flour. So it only takes maybe a, a minute of like pulsing and mixing. And then of course with oat, with oats, they're so soft. You could put oats in a blender and turn your blender on high and leave it alone and then it's flour. So, I mean, even with that, yes, you can buy your own oat flour that's probably just oats and the ingredients. But if you want to like impress your guests sort of thing, be like, oh, yeah, I'm oat flour, you know. So it's like, <laughs> not the people, you know. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, we're finishing up. So I'm just putting one uh, cookie on a plate. So this is it. And you kind of mold it to the shape that you want, you know, nice circular. And actually in the oven, it does spread out a little bit. An oven of uh, 350 degrees. Obviously, it's on a line sheet. And then I'm going to show you the outcome. Da, 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 da. Cookies. Delicious. Mmm. <laughs> cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Delicious. Thank you, Chef Zaria. 
<laughs> so what's exciting about this is, so we have Zaria uh, with cookies and that, and that sweet dessert. And then we also have Yasim with another sweet dessert for us. I think you were going to do pudding, but we've had surprises all night long. So whatever you decide to do today is going to be great. <laughs> all right. So um, I actually made a vegan banana pudding recipe and this vegan yeah, the vegan <laughs> this vegan banana pudding recipe actually started out as guess what ice cream um <laughs> and so uh it's really a super simple thing you're going to take uh one cup of raw cashews and you're going to soak them at the very least overnight i usually do between 36 and 48 hours and two cans of full fat this is important full fat coconut milk and you're going to drop that in your blender with you want a high powered blender drop that in your blender with one tablespoon of cornstarch and you're just going to let that go now you can literally let that go for an hour and it will get almost up to temperature where you'd be able to take that and let it sit but you're going to want to take it and put it into a saucepan now if you ever made a custard um, a standard custard, you take that and put it in a saucepan, medium heat, you want something really heavy and thick, like maybe a Dutch oven, and you're going to stir. And you're going to stir, and you're not going to move away from that stove, because if you do, you will end up with scorched custard, and you don't want that. So you're going to stir, and you're going to stir, and you're going to stir until you start to see a real wake as you drag your spoon from one side to the other, as it begins to wake, and you can sort of see the bottom. That lets you know that it's set up really well. Now, if okay. you want to do something... Hold on, Yassim. Hold on. Yep. Because Chef Tourette did it. No, Chef Tourette did it. She said, uh, we're braising. And people, pe I know people in the chat were like, didn't want to ask what braising was, but we were brave enough. And you said just now two things. One, I'm sure all of you made a custard and then a wake. You used custard and wake. But let's pretend just for my sake <laughs> that I've so never made custard, a custard. <laughs> custard means just making pudding, right? So um, if you're making pudding from scratch, what you're really doing is you're taking um, liquid, fat, and a, a emuls some emulsifier, such as cornstarch, um, and you are heating them together and you are keeping them moving constantly. And as you do that, the emulsifier is gonna thicken everything up and it's going to become a single unit. Um, you also need sugar, I forgot about the sugar. Um, so you're going to keep, stirring that as you cook it, stirring it as you cook it. And then as you go through, you'll actually literally be able to see, like um, you ever see a boat go across the water and as it goes across the water, the water separates for it and it has those waves that come as a side, that's called a wake. And so as you move your spoon or your spatula through, the thicker it gets, the more intense that waking process will go. So when it's really thin, you'll barely see it. But when it starts to get really nice and thick with a couple of C's, then you're going to get that real good wake action as yeah. you stir. And you want to see a nice, a really nice thick wake before you turn it off to allow it to cool. OK, so once you get that nice thick wake where you're actually starting to be able to see the bottom as you drag your spoon across, you're going to turn it off and you want to get it down to about 100 degrees. So you're just going to let it cool. So it gets a bit about 100 degrees. And the reason you're going to do that is because you're going to add in some vegan butter. Now, vegan butter actually did something I wasn't expecting because it was a new addition is it gave it kind of. You ever have the banana pudding that also has the cheesecake in it? The that cheesecake, the cream cheese in it as well. It's got the cheesy. It gave it a very similar favor. And I'm going to say that you should use ooh, um, this Mycos Creamery because it's a cultured vegan butter. So it has a lot more flavor than just a regular vegan butter. Um, and so once that's all, once it gets to about 100 degrees, you're going to add that over. And the reason you're going to wait till it gets cool like that is you don't want your butter to melt too much and then separate your custard. So you want it to get to be at about 100 degrees, which is the melting point. And then you're going to add that over cold, cold butter over into your um, custard. And then it's going to bring, as it melts, it's going to bring your temperature down even more. And it's going to all set up. And then you're going to put that in the refrigerator three to four hours minimum. 
I know that seems like a long time, but it's while it's doing that, you can do the other things like create your uh, crust. Now you can use any kind of cookie you want to make this crust. Um, I love a good Biscoff cookie. I will take that over just about any cookie in the world. And I was so happy to find out that there's no dairy in it. So I took um, one packet of the uh, Biscoff. This is the eight ounce packet. One packet of that and about two tablespoons of butter. And I crushed that all up, made it into a nice sandy crumbly consistency like this. And then I took about one tablespoon of that and pushed it down into here. Now, if you get a third or a fourth of a spoon, a third or fourth of a cup, a uh, cup measure like this, measuring cup like this, you can take it, push it down, and you get yourself a really nice solid base to begin to plate from. So you're gonna take your banana slices and you can put as many banana slices as you want. And the reason I'm doing it in a pan like this is because we're trying to be healthy and really there's not much healthy about this recipe. It's <laughs> got no, you know, there's no dairy in it, but it's got as much sugar. It's got uh, three fourths of a cup of brown sugar. Um, it's got full fat coconut milk. It's got cashews. So it's still gonna come out to be about the same as far as health concerns with regular banana pudding. But by putting in these cup sizes, now one thing that we tend to have an issue with is portion size. Some things aren't necessarily bad for you if you eat just a little. And so by portioning them in nice portion sizes like this, then you can say, hey, this is how much you should have. And sometimes when you give someone a portion size, they're more apt to take what they should versus what their eyes are telling them to. So giving them a visual representation, hey, this is how much you should have, can definitely help people to make better choices this holiday season. So then you're going to top these off, put them in the refrigerator for at least uh, another hour, and then you can top them however you want. If you want to top them with a little more of your cookie, if you want to skip the bisque off and you want to just save yourself some time, you could just take the vanilla wafers. I don't really like vanilla wafers. I know some people really do. I don't really like vanilla wafers at all. So you could just do a vanilla wafer at the bottom. That would make save you some time and would be much easier. You can top them off like that. You can top it off with a nice slice of banana. However you want to top it, it is completely up to you. And at the end, you have a delicious small little cup that has a good portion size of banana pudding that is vegan. It's really delicious. Um, only ingredient I forgot to add is your vanilla extract. Um, but you can take, if you were one of those people that doesn't really, that uses a uh, packaged banana pudding for yours, you can use banana extract to get a similar flavor as the banana pudding that you would get from packaged. So this is easy. It is a bit time consuming, but anyone who, who has never made banana pudding from scratch to this degree knows that this is the kind of love that you have to put in it to make really exceptional banana pudding. And it doesn't taste just like regular banana pudding. It tastes different and it tastes better in my opinion. Um, something about the blend between coconut and the Biscoff cookie, the little bit of the vegan butter and the bananas all coming together. Something about all the vegetables coming together makes it really happy. So if you're interested in this vegan recipe, it will be provided for you at the end of the class. And so I'm really happy that I was able to share this with you today because at the end of the day, you know, we can thank the Lord for this good time that we've had, the good food that we shared and all those good things that really are good cubed. That's so good. Uh, people I know are really excited to be getting this recipe. I know I am. Uh, banana pudding in our family isn't a big thing, but uh, like in Zarya's in my family, we are not banana pudding people, but in my, like with my husband and his people, my goodness, there are fights fights that break out over the banana pudding and who has the best. And if you use wafers and where did you get those Nilla wafers? No, no, no. That store doesn't sell the good ones. So I am a Biscoff fan. I never thought to put it, to use them as banana pudding uh, instead of uh, Nilla wafers. So here we go. Come on, Thanksgiving. Think, Listen, come on. <laughs> stir some up. Start a new war. Start right. a new war. <laughs> new war. Start a new war. It's gonna happen. My uh, my um my bestie, my bestie likes to use chessmen. Um, 
cookies. Oh, the yes. Petrick's Farm. I love Chessman. I love Chessman, but I don't her. think they're vegan. Banana. Yes. <laughs> yep, that's the only reason I didn't no, use them because I'm pretty vegan. sure they use butter. Yep, they they're use butter, vegan. and so that's the that's the only reason I didn't yeah. use those. <laughs> This is very, very well, good, as friends. Well, Julia Chow says, <coughs> butter is flavor. That's it. <laughs> I get you. Sorry, I'm hungry. Good. I hope people, you know, when you send out the recipe, it's it's really, really good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love, I love seeing uh, all of you eating your... <laughs> Sorry, I was eating her cookies. Chef Torah is eating uh, your your squash, your squash soup. We've got Yasim eating banana pudding, and the rest of us are just a little bit sad. A little bit sad. <laughs> Listen, friends, before we start wrapping up, I wanted to. We had a uh, we had Sophia to say, I love all of this melanin, and yes, it is not a coincidence that the chefs, all of you chefs that are here today are chefs of color. And I'm wondering if you would just talk a little bit about the heritage or just the power, the the pride. How about that? That's what I'm really looking for. The pride and heritage about being a chef of color, what you've learned, what you'd like to pass on, anything you'd like to comment about. Man, cooking is just so much of who we are. Um, I remember that uh, a couple of months ago, it blew up on social media about how in some European countries, if you send your kid over to someone else's house, it's not expected and it could even be considered rude for them to feed your child. You not going to somebody of any skin tone <laughs> close to ours and not getting fed. You know, you know that when you go over to to one to, to our house, it's family and we're going to feed you and we're going to love you. And it's just a part of our culture. If we have nothing else to pass down, we have our recipes and in our recipes are our history, the struggle that we've had to endure, the joys that we have created of it. And at the end of the day, food is alchemy. Food is taking history. Food is taking love. Food is taking chemistry, putting it all together and elevating it into something more than that. And so as people of color, as black people, as people of the African diaspora, we are pouring Africa and America and everywhere in between together whenever we put something on a plate. And that right there is magic. That right there is what we do this for, to preserve and to pass forward. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Chef well Perez. well said. Well said, yes, me. Yes, seen. Well said. Well, I mean, if you if folks have Netflix and they haven't seen High on the Hawk uh with Jessica uh, B. Harris, that food historian about um our culture and how we have defined uh really eating in this country. Um, I mean, you can go far as far back the slaves, we were cooking for um, everyone else. We were, we, were, we were making the pâtés. We were making terrines. We were, you know, putting to recipes and things that um, others have adopted. And certainly the, you know, the low country cooking that is being pushed um, by um, a lot of, uh, you know, Caucasian chefs. I mean, we started. Um, you know, no knock to them, but, you know, our food um, really matters. Um, and it's just not, you know, the idea of the soul food in terms of, of uh, additional soul food, but food itself feeds the soul. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, uh, Yassine was, was right on the point with that. Well said. Um, but, you know, yeah, more and more um, black chefs are being recognized as we should. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we just have to be, uh, I think a little bit more vocal, a lot more confident and, and, um, just bold and, in, in, in putting our view and perspective out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Zaria, anything to add? 
Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking, you know, honestly, it 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 feels uh, it feels cool to be like, oh, I'm only like black female in this kitchen right now. All right, cool. Um, I mean, even in my last um, my last job at a restaurant, um, similar to the you know uh, chef who did the tacos. Um, I worked with, you know, I was working with all Hispanics, so, and, you know, Hispanics who um, barely knew English. Um, and so I, I, I really had to, uh, I had to learn the language a little bit. I mean, I don't speak fluently, but I had to also learn the language, but also just, I don't know, I just felt, I don't know if it's silly to say, but yeah, I just like, oh, cool, I'm only like black chick in here or whatever, but also, I was um, I was working on the end of the kitchen where I was doing grill and saute where they're not used to having women on at all. So mm -hmm. all the other um, female line cooks were doing fry and salad and I was in like the hottest station of the kitchen. And so at first, um, especially honestly working with the men, even just being a, a feet of the female, um, it was really hard to get into the kitchen for the men in the kitchen to trust me and to be patient with me um but i started to get it and i was just like eventually i was you know sauteing with the right hand and grilling oh. with the left hand and i just felt awesome and i was just like all right cool and eventually um just getting even just the kitchen lingo lingo as far as like um kitchen spanish <laughs> as they say and it was cool to feel like I gained respect, you know? Um, and at first it, it didn't feel that way, honestly. Um, but eventually, um, especially with the men in the kitchen um, that worked on that side, um, you know, were definitely, were, you know, respecting me more, um, you know, saying hello in their language when they saw me. And even uh, if they were calling out, I mean, uh, you know, executive chef was calling me to take their place because I was the only, other women, the only person who knew, you know, um, grill and saute. So um, it it feels it feels cool to be, you know, just a, a part a part of that. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm checking to see if there are any other questions uh, before in, in the comment section. But before we leave, th one, thank you very much for for sharing all of these recipes. Is there anything? Oh, look, question, question for Chef Tourette. You make one of the best shrimp and grits. How do you master the grits? I goofed the first, second, and the third time. I first, second, and third time I cooked. What's the secret? Oh my goodness. Well, uh, my grits take a really long time to cook. I use a stone ground um, yellow grit. It's an organic grit. But um, for me, um, flavor. How do you add flavor to your food? So I don't use water. I use, I use a stock first. Um, I use stock. Then I add some, um, you know, some milk um, to it. Um, and then I take my time. I, I, I put herbs, um, in my, in, in my grits when I'm cooking it. And I, I just, you know, the flame doesn't have to be up very high. Certainly you want to make sure you're salting your liquid because, um, grits need, need salt. And then you want to, I add, um, certainly lots of butter. So, um, yeah, my, is, my, my stuff is not vegan. Um, but I certainly, um, vegetarians can eat it, um, if you're not, you know, if you so inclined, but, um, I use a vegetable stock that I make and, um, I take my time and I come from the school of thought that you need cheese in your grits. Um, you know, I'm not a sugar in the grits. I, I use a nice cheddar cheese. Yes. Thank you. I mean, I don't know for sugar and grits, but you need cheese. <laughs> Not, you Amen. know, just, a, just a, a nice little hint, but take your time. Take your time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at least an hour or so um, for, my, for my grits. But it starts with the quality no. ingredients. So use a, a nice uh, organic grit if you can. Yes. That's one thing that most people don't realize. You... 
um, I forget what her name is. Ah, she's the black chef. She was on TV on like ABC. Uh, ah, she has glass. She wears glasses. She kind of uh, anyway. She said anytime. Massima. Massima. See, Massima yeah, Bailey. yeah, yeah. Chef and she said yeah. any anyone who says tells you that grits can be made in anything under twenty five minutes is lying to you. Grits take about thirty yeah. minutes minimum. It's 30 minutes minimum, even if they're instant grits. Minimum. You can take an instant grit and you should cook it for at least 30 minutes. Literally, when I make grits, I get my water to a nice boil. I have it all, my grits already measured out. I dump my grits in, stir them. I turn just the pilot light on and put the top on them, let them sit, come back, stir them again in 10 minutes, let them sit. They sit for the minimum of 45 minutes just steaming with just the heat of the pilot, that's how low it is, just the heat of the pilot light, 45 minutes, just steaming, and that's, the grits never, they never fail. It's mm -hmm. just really, you have to give them at the minimum 30 minutes. Anything less than that is a disrespect to the corn, because Dang. corn is so hearty. Corn <laughs> is so hearty, you cannot yeah. just, you can't right. just take dried corn and just say, hey, I'm gonna re, I'm gonna take all that the, those months of water that was taken out of you and put it back in twenty in, in 10, 15 minutes. Not gonna happen. It's gonna take 45, 30 to forty five minutes really is your minimum. So come I with love that the kind don't of respect. Disrespect the corn. <laughs> I, like, I like don't don't disrespect the corn, y'all. If you're gonna make a grit, don't disrespect the corn. Um before well, uh, and we that's go with, and that's with any ingredients, Shannon. One more mm -hmm. quick that's with any ingredients. Um we are the intelligent part of the equation. The cook. Mm -hmm. So you have to respect the ingredients. They won't do anything unless we manipulate them, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you don't have to, things cannot be rushed. You, you know, um, so you, you have to know your products. You can do some research. You can look at some other cooking videos. You can um, check out other recipes. You know, for me, I don't cook, really cook recipes. I look at them inspiration. I use the dye, and then you can add and subtract for for you, you know, um, to make it to make it your own. So if you are a person mm -hmm. that don't, you know, you don't like mushrooms, and the and the recipe calls for mushrooms, don't use them. Put whatever vegetable you like. Then, right? but we are the intelligent part of the equation. So I love that. I think the food uh, one we're nothing. gonna say. Yeah, the food will do it. It's not going to cook itself. <laughs> it's not. Um, Brittany, we're glad to have you back. Thank you. Or I, I know you. I know. I just know. So thank you. Uh, but with that, this idea of one patience. Everyone here has just said having patience with your journey uh, with cooking. And two, we are the intelligent part of the equation. That is going to wrap us up. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you in the chat have just gained so much love, respect, and knowledge from this uh, and inspiration from this discussion and maybe some inspiration as far as what to serve this holiday season or any time. Uh, if you enjoyed this discussion and this, the, all the foods, please join us for next month for the Pieces Collective year end celebration. Ba -ba -ba -ba. It's going to be so much fun. Join us online as we embrace the power of community featuring the TPC, the Pieces Collective makers, Kwanzaa demonstration, <coughs> Pieces Collective Signature Drink Prizes and Tons of Fun. That's Wednesday, December 21st at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I'd also like you just to remember that as we are eating all of this food throughout the holiday season, the Pieces Collective is still doing weekly walks for wellness. And we are trying to strengthen community and support and commitment to our well-being and health. This is what we're doing for these weekly walks. So those weekly walks for wellness are every Sunday at 7.30 a.m. Eastern. As always, 
Thank you, panelists. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you, Zaria. Thank you, Yasim. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Tourette. Thank you, chefs, for being here. Uh, Chef Stretch, who was, was here, thank you. Thank you for being here and sharing yourselves with us uh, and for contributing your beautiful dishes. And thank you very much to Ikrama and Ikrama Mohammed and Karen Freeman for gathering us together tonight through the Pieces Collective. And of course, thank you in the chat. Obviously, we don't do this for no one. We do it for you. And you have to be here so that we can have all of this fun. Uh, that's all for this evening. You've been a wonderful audience, been a wonderful panelist. Enjoy your holidays. And we'll see you next time on The Pieces Collective. Break out the food and the drinks. It's going to be a party. Turn up the music real loud. Invite everybody. Go right ahead and smoke and play some cards. Just make yourself at home. It's okay to take somebody's hand and get your groove on. We're all up in here. Jamming couldn't be better. I love to see my people. Come together. Talking about friends.